Oh, uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Like Amit said, thanks for, for joining us at the Tech on VeloxCon. Super happy to be here. Uh, it's really nice to see, you know, a lot of traction in the industry, so many people, so many different organizations. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, this early in the morning. Um, yeah, I'll try to, like Amit said, maybe I'm, too, I'm not underdressed enough. Maybe next time I'll wear a hoodie or a baseball hat or something a little even less formal. But, uh, but yeah, thanks for joining us this early in the morning. So in this talk, there are kind of maybe four things I want to cover. Uh, we wanna, we're going to have a lot of talks about different aspects of Velox. Uh, the way we're, we're organizing the program is that today we're going to cover most of the sort of SQL analytic engine integration. They're going to be talking mostly about Gluten, Spark integration, and Presto. And then tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of future-looking things, so hardware acceleration. There will be some numbers on GPUs and other, other accelerators, new file formats, and, and things like that. So this is sort of how we organize the program. Uh, so I'm not going to cover anything too specific about Velox or the integrations here. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to discuss. Um, the first thing is just this idea of uh, composability in data management, which is like how, in a way, like how we start at Velox and how we start decomposing data engines into, into components. So I'm going to just kind of give some, uh, an overview of where this came, this, this came from and uh, some updates on where we are on this. Second part is, uh, like I said, I don't want to talk too much about Velox specifically, but I, I do want to give a sense of other use cases we have inside Meta uh, beyond Presto and beyond Spark integration. So, uh, so this is something we always hear from the community, like people want to understand a little more in which other scenarios we use Velox. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, we actually invited two guest speakers. Uh, so we have uh, Deblina here with us. So she's going to talk about the uh, ODS integration of Velox inside Meta. And Manos, who's a remote, is going to talk a little bit about Velox integration and the kind of real-time uh, data infrastructure. I also want to quickly talk about some of the work we did with Voltron Data and the Arrow community around converging and uh, kind of bringing the Velox vectors and the, the Arrow formats a little closer. Just kind of quickly mention where we, we're going next. But this kind of in my perspective, what are the next things we want to look at? So just starting, uh, first part of the talk will be sort of about composability. So just where we started. So if you go almost four years back, uh, we were in this place where you have users, they have different types of workloads with different characteristics, different requirements, and then we used to specialize engines, right? So for, sort of for every type of workload, with slightly different requirements, slightly different characteristics, you just go and kind of de de develop a, a whole kind of full-blown new uh, data management system. So you had this sort of layout where you know, each one of those, uh, those spaces is one type of workload, of course, going from transactional to analytics, streaming, graph, and all this sort of thing. And those kind of vertical bars just means that you actually have a lot of databases. And they're all what we call vertically integrated, right? which means that they don't really share a lot between each other. So every time you develop a new database, you develop the entire uh, stack from scratch. So you write a new SQL parser, write a new optimizer, write a new execution engine, and all of that. So this is where we're coming from. Of course, this is not great because there's not a lot of reusability. So we end up kind of redeveloping many of those things. We don't really share components between databases. And that just causes a lot of fragmentation, right? And fragmentation is not great for, for a lot of reasons. Anyway, so going back to composability, um, causes a lot of fragmentation. Fragmentation, of course, is not great. Everyone kind of suffers from it. Uh, our users suffer from fragmentation. We keep re-implementing the same thing. We write 10 different SQL parsers. They're all incompatible. And then users, they need to learn about the difference between all those. So it's not great for users, for, especially for large organizations when you need to develop and maintain not just one, but 10 or 20 of different systems. Like it's really painful. Like you need to have one system to develop and maintain uh, each engine. You end up kind of redoing a lot of the integrations. You need to enhance 10 different engines. So from a kind of an engineering perspective, it's not great. But it's also not cool for us as engineers. Like you don't want to be keep, kind of keep rewriting the same thing, rewriting substring functions and JSON parsers and things like that. We actually want to focus on innovation and doing cool things. Just kind of keep repeating and re rewriting the same things we already wrote in the past. It's just, it's not fun. So that's how we got to this idea of composable data management. So like we discussed, this, this idea of making things a little less uh, vertical and making data management system development, development more horizontal, right? And what I mean by that is that you would kind of decompose those things into a stack of components. You would define the API, the responsibilities, and then you could reuse those components across, uh, across silos or across uh, vertical systems, right? Uh, and that's good for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the, the reasons is that, well, if you just have one single parser, if you have one single execution engine, then you actually provide, you know, a more consistent experience to, to users. 
and then better experience for users is great. Um, we have, of course, many, many engineers developing those systems. We have many, many more users using those systems. So kind of lowering the cognitive burden required in users uh, or that kind of we place on users, uh, this, is, this is great and just benefits the entire community. So yeah, so back in the day, we put this shared foundation paper together, which was a little more like from Meta's perspective, what we're doing to kind of improve the engineering efficiency of our organization. That was pretty well received. Uh, they got published at CIDR last year, but I think we wrote it 2022. And, uh, and more recently, we published this vision paper, which is um, also got pretty well received. We, we presented this at VLDB a few months back. So this, uh, we call this the composable data management system manifesto, which is this idea. Us as engineers, we don't want to do this again. We don't want to redevelop new things. Like we think that, you know, the, kind of the software engineering process behind developing data engine is just, just like. So this is the, um, the data stack we presented at this, um, on the paper. Um, yeah, no real surprises here. Of course, it's a little more like an execution perspective of uh, data management systems, but essentially this idea that it doesn't matter which data system you're looking at, they all kind of compose of the same layer. So every single data management system has some sort of language layer, either SQL parser or you know, some non-SQL API or some sort of language that users interact with. Uh, you parse whatever the, the input user specified, you translate in some sort of more structured representation of your query, which uh, we usually refer to as IR. That usually goes through an optimizer. Of course, some systems don't have optimizer. In some cases, in some cases, optimizers are a little more sophisticated than others. But there's always some sort of optimization step based on the IR before you execute things. And there's usually a library or some code that is able to execute this uh, this IR, which is of course uh, valid. And then there's usually a, a runtime or one environment that can actually put all those things together. So one, of it, one way of, of looking at those things is that language, IR, optimizer, and execution engine, like those things are usually libraries. And the runtime is just the environment that kind of stitch all of them together. Right? And then the runtime is usually very specific to the uh, workload or to the type of queries you want to execute. So for example, Presto would have more like a streaming runtime. Uh, Spark would have its own Spark runtime. If the stream processing system would have a more kind of stream-oriented uh, runtime. But the language, IR, optimizer, and execution engine, they're pretty, pretty similar across the stack. So then when we presented the paper, we made two sort of bold claims, but somehow have been uh, holding so far. First one is that this model is general. So actually, if, if you can look at any data management system targeted to any type of workload, they all have the same layer, uh, the same set of layers. Like I said, in some cases, those things are more sophisticated or kind of a little more specialized, but all of them are kind of composed of those layers. Second one is that if you look at every single layer across different data management systems, they're actually a lot more similar than what we expect. So for example, if you look at SQL parser for, I don't know, an analytics engine and an OLTP database, they're sort of the same, like with minor difference. Then of course, if you're coming to the, uh, Velox, if you look at the, from the execution perspective, they're also very, very similar. So there's nothing fundamentally different. There's of course like some, some smaller difference, some specializations in systems. But I think the idea we presented is that we should focus on the kind of the commonalities or the things we share across systems rather than the, the difference. Uh, what we heard a lot from, you, from developers or from people who have been engaged in developing those systems is that it's usually like, you know, we have this specific feature and this is just not supported. So let's go and rewrite the entire thing from scratch. So the, the point was just, okay, if you have something specialized, like how can we actually extend this generic thing to provide the right accessibility APIs so you can go ahead and just plug in your specific behavior, but not having to rewrite the entire stack. So this thing has been reasonably well um, accepted. We have this nice quote, the future of uh, data management is composable. So this is sort of the story. Um, in the meantime, the community has really picking up. There's a lot of projects in different layers of the stack. If you go on the language layer, um, IBIS is uh, kind of growing pretty fast. Inside Meta, we have an um, internal parser, kind of a shared parser project called Crux. Uh, ZetaSQL is another good example, Postgres parser. There's a lot of kind of more modular parsers that are already available in the industry. They're kind of getting more and more popular. On the, uh, the IR side, Substrate is probably the kind of the main project on that space, even though different companies might have other, um, other alternatives. But there's, there's also some progress on that area. Um, we've been discussing that maybe it's something more composable for optimizers, uh, something closer to call site, but maybe taking those ideas even further. Um, Ori has started this uh, interesting project called Verax some time ago. I think we, we do think that it's very kind of 
too early days, but we, we think that there's something that can be done to kind of modularize optimizers and make at least some of those rules or at least the logic of kind of expanding the search space and kind of you know, the APIs to plug in uh, statistics and things like that. Like th all those things can be, can be abstracted out. And of course, in the execution engine, there's well, Velox. There's also some, some other interesting projects, but we, we do believe that Velox is sort of the state of the art. Cool. So that was sort of the idea around composability. Getting to Velox, like I said, I'm not going to give too many details, just as uh, probably most of you guys already know that the project we started in 2020. Uh, we open source about two years ago in 2022, it's been two years now. And the, the main value proposition was kind of threefold. First one was just regular efficiency. So the idea is that by kind of re-implementing those things, moving a lot of this Java code base to C++, but also kind of really being really careful about how we design the loops, like really implemented, implementing vectorization and, and some of the optimizations I'll describe. Like that just provides a lot of efficiency. Exactly how much it depends on the baseline. Uh, we usually see something like 3x to 4x on Presto workloads when you move from Java to C++. Again, depends on the baseline. So that was kind of the first uh, part of the proposition. The second one is just this idea of engineering efficiency. Right? So you want to be able to kind of evolve and to innovate faster in your stack. Um, and if you have components that you can actually reuse, and if you have APIs that you can you can leverage, it just it makes it uh, a lot easier. But also this idea of consistency, right? So if you have one single implementation, then sort of almost by design, you provide a consist a more consistent experience to users. And then the vision for Velox is to, in a way, commoditize execution. Right, so just getting to a point where people don't even consider quality of, you know, should you use code gen vectorization or whatever, you just, you know, use this library because it's library state of the art, and they just solve all of your problems. And you can extend that in all sorts of ways. That's really quick on what, at least in my opinion, what makes Valak special. The first one is just this idea of being universal, right? So it's something that we, as much as we can, we try to develop. In a, in a generic way, so we can use across different engines, so we can use to implement different dialects. Um, but also providing extensibility APIs so that it can be used in all sorts of uh, different scenarios. Second one is around vectorization. So we really pay attention to how we design our loops. Uh, I think Ori is always saying that the, the little loops are very important. So just how you break them, making sure that the loops are really tight and just being very efficient about that. It's not super, super novel in the industry, but just you know, having a, a, a reliable um, implementation of those things that just works out of the box, that's integrated in all the systems, like that does provide a lot of value. Also, this idea of adaptivity, which is a, a little more like as you process your data, as you learn more information about your execution, like as you start seeing batches of data, kind of keeping track of statistics and using that to optimize your execution. So we do a lot of that in many cases, things like reordering uh, filters, reordering conjuncts, figuring out what you need to prefetch, uh, pushing down things, uh, pushing down selective joints through table scan. So there's a lot of places where we do that. We keep track while you're executing, you keep track of statistics, and then you can kind of reorganize your execution and make it more efficient. There's another thing that we really leverage as well. And lastly, this idea of compressed execution is a little more that you can actually leverage the, the encodings of the data to provide more efficient uh, execution. So not just leveraging the encodings when the data is already encoded, but for things like executing joints and as filters, you can actually you don't need to rewrite the data, you can just play with the dictionaries. And it can be a lot more efficient while doing that. So this is sort of what all I have to say about Velox. So Jimmy is here, he has a really nice talk describing a lot of the optimizations, some of the new things we've been um, doing in Velox. So yeah, if you're interested in this sort of things, just make sure you attend his talk. And then we get to the second part of the talk. So uh, I want to describe a little bit more about some of the main usages of Velox inside Meta. First, just before we get to that, just quickly describing the data stack to contextualize. This is also something we published at Cider last year. If you kind of abstract and abstract 10 more times the data stack, this is sort of what you see, at least uh, from the Meta's perspective on how we organize our data systems. Super high level, you have users interacting with services. Those services usually have, you know, state on OLTP databases and they generate logs. And it's a stream processing system that takes those logs, do some processing, generate more logs. There is an ingestion process that both take logs from the log messaging system and ingest them in the warehouse, but also scrape the OLTP databases and ingest the data in the warehouse. And on the other, this is kind of on the warehouse ingestion path. And on the other side, you have systems that actually read this data and, and, and process the warehouse data. There are three main 
there's a lot more, but the three main workloads are just batch processing, which is this idea of kind of processing really large amounts of queries, uh, joining tables, that you're doing feature engineering and generating other large tables. Uh, second use case is a little more kind of dashboard generation where you're just consuming, kind of generating dashboards, generating charts, and kind of slicing and dicing your data. And the third one is just ML training. And then on the side, we have a monitoring stack. One of the main systems is this operational data store, which essentially lets you kind of capture performance metrics and all sorts of time series and index and then you know, provide an environment where developers can, uh, can debug and understand the performance of those. If you look at Velox integration, this is what it looks like today. So it's integrated kind of across the board in all those systems. Of course, some systems use a lot more from Velox than others, but just to give uh, an overview of where we, Velox is used today. Um, the main integration is we have is uh, Meta, uh, at Meta is Prestissimo. Uh, we have actually two talks talking about this. Uh, Amit Duda is gonna talk about the Prestissimo integration and some of the work we've been doing recently specifically inside Meta, and Aditi is going to describe this uh, Prestissimo a little more from an IBM perspective. Both of talks, uh, both talks will be at some point today. Second one is uh, Velox, how Velox is being leveraged on the log messaging infrastructure. And for that, we're going to call the first guest speaker, uh, Manus, I think he's on the call, uh, just to cover the scribe part. Um, I'm Fox Hearman. I think we can hear you, but maybe if you can put the volume up a little bit. Uh, sure. Is, is this any better? Yeah, you can hear. Lovely. Uh, hey, everyone. So uh, as far as log messaging is concerned, think of a large scale service that is responsible for moving all forms of data from point A to point B in meta scale. And although we describe it as logs, you can imagine that there's all sorts of data that's going to end up being used in uh, analytical processing. One of the patterns that we have seen in recent times is that while in general data might uh, have been read uh, once, so every byte written was actually read once or maybe two times, we see more and more cases of power loss being demonstrated. Cases where the same popular data sets are actually very useful for many different use cases. And what, we, what happens in these scenarios is that in many of these use cases, you end up having row-oriented data flows. And then those data flows are then being processed by uh, different downstream processors. These downstream processors have to pay the deserialization tax again and again. And this deserialization tax involves reading some form of input data set, veloxifying it, and then going ahead and performing subsequent processing. The other part is that out of these data flows, we have many use cases that are actually interested in data subsets. It's fairly frequent to have a very denormalized representation and thus a lot of unnecessary traffic having to reach the stream processing applications or this, uh, for example, these training applications. So if we move to the next slide, we can actually see how we use the looks to our advantage. The main insight is that we introduce the ability to turn all of the various diverse input types into VLOOKs. And then given that we have some formats, that are, some, uh, some flows that are more popular than others, we would go ahead and cache the VLOOKs representation and at the same time be able to push down uh, filtering predicates to, to our log messaging layer. The general idea is that by having VLOOKs as our canonical in-memory representation, we introduced a, uh, a couple of plugins that are dealing with turning different types of input into VLOX, and then different output plugins that could be responsible for turning VLOX into the data serialization of choice for our downstream uh, consumers. What this allowed us to do is to columnarize presentations and thus pay the deserialization tax only once, and thus multiple downstream uh, applications were able to use the same optimal presentation. And also, given that all of these downstreams are also speaking VLOX, essentially, as you're going to see in the next slides, we had the same lingua franca. We were able to decide whether a filtering predicate makes more sense to be evaluated in this upstream layer or whether it needs to be evaluated in another layer. The final part is that with this machinery in place, we can even go ahead and move one step further. 
and figure out scenarios where if our upstreams are actually able to generate voluminous data batches, why even use a serialization and why even use a format that is not VLOX ready from the get-go? So we are currently working on VLOXifying data, even upstream uh, at our customers layers. So this is uh, a very high level description of what we have been doing in the log messaging layer of Meta and back to you, Pedro. All right, thank you, Manus. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this is uh, the integration on the log messaging pipe itself. Uh, like I mentioned, we also have a stream processing system that was developed in house called Xstream, which is built on top of Velox. And this leveraged the infrastructure that Manus mentioned. So when you read your logs from Scribe, you can actually get this data already columnarized, already encoded using Velox. Uh, so this data usually is already read as batches. You just take those batches and you can process them just as you would in a regular uh, analytic query engine. So you kind of reuse all of that. This um, stream processing system is also compatible with Presto SQL. So we, like I mentioned, we have this internal um, SQL parser that we also reuse here. So it provides users, it's of course, it's a subset of Presto SQL, but it provides users a more consistent experience across analytics and, and stream process. The, the last part of uh, around real-time infrastructure is ingestion. Um, so the system works in a similar way, right? So you can take um, this data out of Scribe, like the log messaging system, and you can use Velox to apply things like projections, filters, um, and you actually encode this data and generate warehouse files. Uh, so this is also being used both on the warehouse ingestion where you ingesting logs into the warehouse, but also when you're scraping uh, when you're scraping uh, OLTP databases to ingest on the, um, on the warehouse. Uh, for the next part of this talk, I'm gonna call, uh, we have another guest speaker. So the Blina will be talking about some of the Velox use cases on the, the monitoring space for time series. Thanks, Pedro. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Deblina Gupta. I'm an engineer at the monitoring and observability space in Meta. And today I'm going to talk about how we are leveraging Velox for time series processing. So uh, ODS, or uh, Operational Data Store, is um, a monitoring system that collects and stores time series data uh, that's used for uh, monitoring the health and performance of services and systems in Meta. And this data can be then queried in a various ways. Like, for example, you can use um, the ODS UI, or you can set up dashboards and detectors. So the challenge is ODS is old. Uh, it's more than 15 plus years. And with that, we bear the cost of uh, having to do maintaining the legacy code and rewriting a bunch of uh, legacy stuff to be able to uh, tackle the growth. And talking of growth, we, uh, we have about 160 billion active time series, which is like the last 26 hours of data. Uh, that's the most useful or relevant for um, detection systems. And uh, uh, we have about 1 trillion data points ingested per minute. and Two billion queries per minute. So we are basically working on the next gen ODS, which is not just to tackle the scaling and uh, growth challenges, but also to be able to support some of the new use cases uh, that we have uh, with high cardinality dimensional uh, time series data, where it doesn't really fit with the data model that we have currently or the query capabilities. So the next gen ODS is basically uh, it, is a, it has a tabular data model, which is a semantically rich dimensional data model. And uh, we also have a new, uh, a new query language, which, well, syntax-wise and semantic-wise, it's mostly focused on accessing time series data. Uh, but if you look at the underlying operations, it's basically SQL-like. We, we have um, all of the, the common um, uh, uh, functionalities and operations that we need. So that's why when we were thinking of implementing the the query engine, Velox, was like a natural fit. And this also ties very well to the initial discussion or the initial talk that um, uh, Pedro was saying about how the different data systems basically have the same layers. Um, so on the left-hand side is mainly like an overview of, uh, well, it, this is a very typical time series ingestion and like a time series system that you can see. We have ingestion layer and then we have data store and then on the query side, we basically have a data fetch layer that fetches the data from our data stores, and then it goes through the time series processing layer. So for the time series processing, as I said, we have our own query language, and right now we have our own parser and semantic analyzer, though we are looking at um, leveraging Crux that um, is also a meta um, 
initiative that uh, we could be using for the uh, the semantic layer as well. Uh, but right now we have our own. But then we have uh, uh, like uh, underlying for the en execution engine. We basically are using Velox for all of our executions and. Uh, it just to talk about the use cases, we obviously have Velox vectors and the execution engine where we are using projections, filtering, aggregations, windowing, all the uh, typical operations that you can think of. But we are also being able to benefit a lot from Velox memory management because uh, we are able to leverage that to sort of provide uh, or like have limits around um, like the overall memory being used or even like per query limits. So that's been uh, really helpful for even like own protections. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it over to Pedro. Mm. Thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, Dublina. Uh, I think I still have ten minutes, so you guys are, you know, still have a few minutes to go. I don't really see Amit Duda here, who's the next speaker. Is he here? So um, hopefully he will, uh, he'll, he'll make it on time. Um, all right, so just the, the last thought about comp composability. Like I said, I have ten minutes, so maybe I'll try to move a little quicker. Um, but like we discussed, we have this uh, set of components, layers, uh, and those things only work if you have APIs that are common, that are kind of stable and well understood by those components. And of course, one of those main, the main APIs, and here he is, right on time. Um, and one of those uh, APIs is, of course, Apache Arrow. Like that's the main uh, sort of API that systems use to transfer columnar data between each other. When we created Velox back in the day, for many reasons, we actually decided to deviate from the, the Arrow standard because we we saw that through benchmarks and through kind of uh, running some experiments that if we change the data layout, we could actually process data in some situations uh, a lot faster, so it could be more efficient. There was a decision back in the day of like, okay, extending Arrow is going to be a longer process, or actually let's start with something specific to Velox. Um, so, so those things kind of deviated, and of course, there are a lot of systems have. Uh, requirements to interoperate with uh, with arrow so we ended up creating some conversion story between velox vectors and arrow and arrow and that wasn't as efficient as it could about a year ago we started partnering with the arrow community and, and voltron data to just kind of discuss how we could align those two formats and that uh, today we just well we recently announced but there was three new formats that uh, were kind of inspired on velox that were added to arrow just kind of quickly over in that going over the three formats the first one was string view so just the way we represent strings and Velox was uh, was different from Arrow. It was inspired by a system in a system called Umbra. It's also something that people usually call the, the German string notation, right? But it's just it's not uh, in the traditional string representation in Arrow is essentially like a, a vector of of uh, characters, while on the string view you have a little more uh, metadata. So you usually store the size of your string, a prefix of the string, and then some pointers to where the string starts uh, on a, to a separate buffer. And then it has some interesting properties of that strings that are small up to 12 bytes, they're all inline. So, um, you know, processing smaller strings is a lot more efficient because you don't need to kind of the reference a separate buffer. Um, we can also compare things like where you can fail fast comparisons. In a lot of cases, you can just do that based on the metadata. It also gives you more flexibility to implement things like substring and trim. So, it just got, like it makes the string processing uh, a lot more flexible. So, this was recently added in Arrow 15. Second thing is list views. So the traditional way to represent lists in Arrow is you have a, a buffer that contains the, all the, the kind of flattened elements uh, and one vector that just represents the offset. In Velox, we actually have a representation that contains both offsets and length. Uh, and of course, like on the common case, this is, uh, you can make the case that this contains redundant data, but this also gives you a lot more flexibility on how you create and how you organize the, the arrays on your buffer. And we, we also leverage that fact to uh, kind of speed up processing in many cases. Like I said, for things like uh, if you're slicing the vector or the, those lists, or if you kind of removing uh, elements from either the, the head or the tail of the list, like you can make those things, or you can implement those things a lot more efficiently. And the last thing was just uh, adding run length encoding. Uh, we don't use RLE, uh, strictly speaking, as much in Velox, but we do use constants quite a lot. So the, the fact that we, we ended up adding uh, Run end encoding to error, which is a slightly vari variation of RLE. At least let us represent constants, and we can at least uh, convert REEs that have a single run into Velox uh, constants. So that means that we can be a lot more efficient while converting data from, from Velox vectors into error and, in, and from error into Velox vectors, which is something that we, we really care about in the decomposable world, right? Where you have components and compo components need to interoperate with each other. 
So yeah, all those things were added by a few people from Voltron Data. Thank you guys a lot for, for all the help on that work. They're all already available with the latest error release, just I think out somewhere in February. Uh, we also have a, a blog post where we, we discuss some of those details. So if you guys are interested, just follow that post. Um, I have a few more minutes. I just want to kind of give a quick uh, idea of, at least in my perspective, like what's next and some of the things we have been looking at a little more, not kind of six month perspective, like a, a year, uh, a little more in the future. There are three main things I want to discuss. First one is just file formats. So um, I think especially if you, if you look at uh, kind of training workloads and machine learning workloads, uh, it's really common that you have files that just have many, many streams. You have in some cases, we have more than thousands to ten thousands of columns or streams inside those columns. And what we started observing is that this just breaks current file formats in all sorts of ways. So the first thing we, we try to address is just how can we better organize the metadata and better organize the streams to make it more efficient for those use cases. But the other thing we notice is that there's also very little flexibility on how data is encoded in current file format. Look at 4K, um, ORC, Dwarf, they only support a very kind of limited set of encodings, and, and that's sort of it. Uh, and those things were all developed 10 years ago and they haven't evolved all, all that much. While the actual state of the art and data encoding has evolved quite fast. Okay. The, uh, the other main point was how can we make this a little more decoupled from the file format so, so that you both can add new encodings as you know, people develop and come out with, with more data. But also can you make, how can you make those things cascading so we can actually you know, encode data and kind of re-encode and then hopefully provide a much more um, efficient way to store and, and process the data. So we have created this uh, file format internally called Alpha, which we just renamed uh, as Nimble. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to have a talk by Yoav, who's going to talk all about this. So you know, if you're interested in this, make sure you follow this talk. Second part is just idea, this idea of compressed execution. The, the idea is that, of course, like the more you compress this data, the more kind of tightly those things are stored on disk. Like the worse it is when you load that into your engine and you have to decompress everything. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of places in Velox where we already do this thing uh, that we call compressed execution or encoding aware execution, which is actually leveraging the encoding of your data to pro process this data more efficiently. Like a good example is if you're filtering a data set, you actually don't need to rewrite this thing. You can actually just wrap that as a dictionary that only contains the, the records that survive the future. So I think that that's something we have been uh, looking uh, a little more closely as well, especially for batch workloads, where in a lot of cases you're essentially reading data from a few tables that are already kind of very tightly encoded, doing some type of processing, and then on the other side writing this, uh, this data again. How can we prevent this overhead of actually reading, decompressing everything, executing our operation, and then recompressing the data? And actually just reading the data already encoded or compressed, executing some operations and kind of leveraging this data as you is write the data. Of course, this doesn't work in every single case, depending on the, it depends on what you're doing with the data, but there's a lot of opportunities here. Of course, it gets more complicated as queries have more stages, and there's also some, some initial investigations on how much of that can be preserved through shuffle boundaries and things like that. So this is a, something that is very kind of important for us. A lot of the really heavy feature engineering workloads, that's essentially what they do, like try to compact this data as much as you can. And then there's some transformations, and you want to do that as efficiently as you can. And if you don't need to decompress and recompress your data, this can be done a lot more efficiently. So just this idea of kind of doubling down and doing a lot more compressed execution is something we're going to be looking at. And lastly, kind of the last thing I just want to quickly mention is about hardware acceleration. We have a full day tomorrow, essentially just talking about this topic. But just this idea that, at least in our opinion, we, we believe that Hardware accelerators have not been kind of used more uh, pervasively in data management because of fragmentation. Because integrating those things into a data management system is just so expensive that it's just something you don't want to do many times. So if you look at things from that perspective, Velox is a great platform. Right? If we're assuming that Velox is being integrated in many data engines in the industry, if you have your accelerator, you just go and plug it into Velox, and then it's great. It works for Presto, it works for uh, Spark, it might work for training workloads and, and all of that. Um, so we have this new API in Velox that Ori has been developing called Velox Wave. Of course, the idea is that the programming model you need for CPUs and things like GPUs, they're, they're very different, right? So the idea is how can you extract some of this parallelism, but it still allow people from kind of plugging different accelerators into Velox by using this framework in a, kind of in a, in a much easier way than having to rewrite the entire thing. So the, tomorrow morning, uh, Ori will have a uh, keynote talk that is just going to describe and talk all about this. So 
you guys are interested, just make sure you, you follow this talk. With that said, I think I'm right on time. So just wanna have one quick slide to wrap up. Just we came a long way. There's many things we've been doing as a community, but just there's so much more to be uh, that we, we need to do outside of file formats, hardware acceleration. There's just a lot of work and just adding features and optimizations, efficiency, reliability. So there's there's a lot of work. So we do need a huge community. We're super happy to have all of you guys here. I think just remember that the, the point of this conference, of course, like we want to inform, we want to talk about projects, but one of the main things is just celebrating the projects and sort of appreciating and again celebrating the progress we've been making. Like it really takes a, a village. So we you know want to thank all of you guys for all the help of the project. Uh, it's also about creating connections. So just make sure you talk to people, talk to your peers, make new connections. And thanks for, for coming and putting up with me. Enjoy the program. Thank you. All. Do, we, do we have time for questions? We do. All right. So let's do a few questions and in the meantime I'll, I'll set up a minute presentation. Any questions? Comments? I have a, I'm going to throw I'm going to throw a mic to you. So everybody here. ready? What, what do you think will be the like challenge for the composable data, data database system management? What is I mean the one of the challenges are the main yeah, challenge. What what are the challenges you are seeing for the composable like mm -hmm. data management system? You mean challenge or change? Like challenge. Oh challenge. Yeah. I think I think the main thing we see is that like all those things make a lot of sense in, in paper, right? Like, no, I, I don't think any engineer would disagree that those things should be libraries, that they should have kind of common APIs. Problem is uh, there is a lot of cost in doing that, like especially for things that already exist. So I think at least for us, it's always a question of, in the end of the day, ROI. Right? So you want to have all those things, but how much does that actually add to the organization? And there, there, there's a, a kind of a high investment in doing that. You need to pay engineers, like people need to work on that sometimes for years. I think it's just like how exactly you frame this and how do you explain what's the, the value of doing some of those things. I feel like as we develop new engines from scratch, there's a lot, it's a conversation that's a lot easier. So if people, I think we have a lot of examples of kind of companies, startups, that are just kind of developing uh, new systems. But it's just a lot easier, right? If we're gonna develop, develop something from scratch and there's a library you can just reuse and assemble all those things, it's a lot easier. But now looking at things like Presto, Spark, DB2 and all those systems that already existed, already stable, kind of justifying this investment can be tricky sometimes. Uh, we, we, do, we, we still see value, that's why we're doing that with Presto. Uh, from Presto side, it's a little more about just efficiency, right? We can show that, well, in the end of the day, your footprint will get three or X, four X or 10 X cheaper, then it still justifies investment. But just like how you frame the, the investment in doing this. Uh, thank you, I have a non-technical question. Uh, say 30 years ago, uh, um, operating systems were uh, dominated by, you know, AIX, uh, Solaris, HP, UX, etc. And Linux was, in 91 it came out, was more of a curiosity. Um, but Linux has, uh, I mean, if in, up in, the, in the world of operating systems, has a lot of the same advantages that you're, uh, that you're, you're proposing with uh, uh, in the composable database manifesto. Um, it seems to me, at least uh, customers that I talk to, would like to see the same side of change going from proprietary databases to uh, to non-proprietary databases, more, more uh, uh, you know, being dominated by, uh, by by open databases. What do you think needs to happen for, uh, let's put it this way, for open databases to eat the world of proprietary databases the way Linux ate the world of uh, proprietary Unixes? That's a good question. I think a, a lot of that maybe comes down to maturity, right? I think some of the proprietary databases, they just have been around for much longer. They're much, you know, much more reliable. They have larger companies backing them up. And, and there's also a certain degree of vendor lock-in. You have like you know, banks and things are just like, moving those things to a separate system. It's just, it's, it's so expensive that's not worth it. Um, I do feel, and that's something, one of the things we discussed in the vision paper, like we, we see that this is changing now that open source big data technologies are becoming more mature. Uh, we also see a shift in uh, a lot more of the cloud vendors, including IBM, like you're kind of sort of moving from this mode of kind of just providing proprietary databases to providing actually open source uh, big data tools. So, um, I, I think in a way, maybe it's, it's about maturity and just getting those communities to a point where they're kind of stable enough. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I have a great question, but that, that, at least that would be my first thought. I think it's food for thought for everyone here. Sounds good. Thank you.